Realm presents Tales Beyond Time, episode 23. Welcome once again, fellow travelers, to Tales Beyond Time, presented by Realm. I'm your host, Marco Palmieri, and I'm delighted to take you on a voyage into a world that never was, but might have been. This week, we're bringing you part one of a two-part special by the Sunburst Award-winning Canadian writer A.M. Delamonica. Their alt-history novelette, A Key to the Illuminated Heretic, was originally published in 2005 in the Bain Books anthology Alternate Generals 3, was nominated for a Sidewise Award, and is narrated for Realm by Shiromi Arsario and Matt Godfrey. The premise is simple. What if Joan of Arc had not been burned at the stake in 1431? Gentle listeners, I give you A Key to the Illuminated Heretic, Part 1. Frontispiece. Joan of Arc stands chained in a horse-drawn wagon, wearing a black gown. Leaning against a pair of nuns, she seems almost to swoon. Her right arm is portrayed as bones without flesh. The horse's ornate curls and gleaming teeth lend a ghastly note, and blackened angels border the image. The scene is easily recognized. The maid's debilitation, the nun's, and especially the cloud of larks above, serve to identify it as Joan's journey to the trial that ended her thirteen-year imprisonment for heresy. It was at this exoneration trial that she encountered Dulis Olon, the Jeanist artist responsible for the holy pictures on which the Codex Illuminations are based. We mustn't face the king in battle. Joan had the light, clear voice of a young woman, even after her years in prison and the hard decades since her release. She'd asked one of the new archers, a girl of perhaps seventeen, to cut her hair, and a few broken strands of silver hair clung to her neck. The rest lay at her feet, bright in the glow of the dying fire. Not fight, Charles. Ermelon was incredulous. He was a badger of a man, with a dramatic, pointy face and remarkable speed with a sword. We must turn his army back before it unites with the force of mercenaries coming up from Rome. If you can't see that, can't see it. Who ordered us to turn north, days before anyone knew the king had pursued us into Burgundy? You, he began, and as her brow came up, he corrected. Your voices. They were nearly of a height, less than perfect subjects for a drawing. From her seat in the shadowed corner of the tent, Dulice tried to capture the dirt on Joan's blue tunic and leggings, her sheathed knife of a body. She was all deadly intent, a knight with a lined face and too many scars. Her eyes blazed. It was a wonder Ermelon did not flinch from the heat there. What I do not see is why Charles is coming at all, she said. He's an old man. He never led men at arms before. Politics, he replied. So says Marcel Renan. He would bring that filthy word into it. She waved off the archer gently, shaking out her shorn locks as the girl left. We can win this battle, Joan, Ermelon said. We would win. She dismissed the issue as she took up her sword. But God did not have me crown this king only to tear him down. She had no doubt at all and it was plain Omelon was surprised. Misunderstanding Joan, as usual, Dulis thought. He thinks she fears defeat, but it is victory that worries her. Dulis herself didn't share their belief in the small Jeannist army, or even sometimes in the maid's heretical faith. Her uncle had been Joan's squire years ago in the fight against England and Burgundy. He had brought Dulis with him to the maid's exoneration trial, and Joan spotted her in the crowd. She'd been drawing the scene on a scrap of vellum. Perhaps because Joan couldn't read, the image had captured her as firmly as the making of it gripped young Dulis. Joan had adopted the girl on the spot, keeping her close ever since. Her need for a record of her doings was so strong 
She never questioned whether her handmaiden's truest love was for God, or merely for pen and page. If we stay this course, we will meet Charles. Hermelon pressed, then we'll fight, ready or not. I'm telling you, we must pray for Joan, an army that does nothing but pray is just a moving monastery, he thundered. Her chin came up. And an army that never prays? Emerges victorious, probably. He strode from the tent, stomping off into the sound of men breaking camp. Though conversations, the snorts of horses and the groans of wagons being loaded. Birdsong rose above the murmur of preparation. The air was mild and damp. It had rained the night before. No time for mass this morning, Dulis said, making herself noticed for the first time. We'll say a quick one now, just us two. Stretching, Joan raised her sword in an attack pose, spearing an invisible enemy through the chest. Will there be church bells ahead? We might hear Otto. And there's a monastery east of there, Saint-Benoît. If we keep this direction, you might hear one or the other ringing vespers tonight. She was happy to give the answer. Joan loved bells for they often brought her voices to her. Of course we will march, Joan said. For just an instant she sagged, and the younger woman saw the chasm of years between them. God set us on this path, not me. Dulis teased out the piece of paper, translated the words into Latin, and wrote them at the bottom of the page as Joan gathered up the cut hair on the ground and tossed it into the fire. The tent filled with black, stinking smoke, making them both cough. Joan smiled apologetically. It's the only way to keep the soldiers from making talismans of it. Or selling it to relic makers, Dulis thought, nodding her understanding as she roughed in the lines of a portrait. There would be time to add the details later. First Communion The maid emerges from a shop wearing men's clothing and carrying bread and wine. A faintly sinister St. Catherine hovers behind her, seeming to whisper in her ear. The passers-by surrounding Joan all have their eyes turned in her direction. The inscription and the spires of saint Ouen in the background make it apparent that Joan has just suffered her famous rejection at that church, turned away on her first attempt to celebrate Mass as a free woman. Now she will administer the sacrament herself. Contemporary accounts differ on the issue of whether Joan knew in that moment that she was about to create a new faith that would shatter Rome's hold over Europe. Ermelon raised a crumb of bread and his glass of wine. This is my body, he intoned in Latin with the other worshippers. This is my blood. Riding all day had blackened his mood. In the months since Pope Calixtus had decided to expunge the maid's followers from the soil of France, Joan had kept them moving, choosing small battles and defending Jeanist villages against mobs from neighboring Catholic towns. They might have kicked out the Pope's teeth earlier if they'd moved with more certainty. Now his jaws were closing on them. In remembrance that Christ died for me, I feed on him in my heart with thanksgiving. His eyes roamed the congregation, looking for Delise. She fancied she could make herself invisible, but he found her easily enough. There, wearing the gray dress and standing in the corner. She was between two of the men, praying unobtrusively and watching Joan. Her voice did not carry to his ears, but seeing her warmed him. She was beautiful and passionate both, an irresistible lure to his thoughts. The body of Christ, the bread of life. Prayer complete, Ermelond laid the bread on his tongue. It was no great surprise that the host still felt like what it was, a lump of bread. There were times when it was subtly different, exalted somehow. Those were the moments that bound him to this faith, bone and sinew. As for today, he shrugged inwardly. This was hardly the first time he'd felt neither the power nor the grace of bread and wine transubstantiated. Perhaps tomorrow he would find the peace of mind required for true piety. Ahead, in the field they had blessed as a temporary church, 
Joan swallowed her host, face lit with joy. There was nothing of the warrior about her now. As far as he knew, the miracle had worked for her every time since she had remade the sacraments for them all. Today's Latin lesson had been given by a wounded former monk from Bordeaux. Now, at his urging, Joan strode to the front of the assembly and they repeated the words she spoke at her heresy trial. It was their movement's signature prayer. If I am not in God's grace, may he put me there. If I am, may he keep me there. The congregants' voices rang with conviction. They all believed that clergy could block the path to heaven. Even so, it strengthened their faith when their maid led them in prayer. Here in church, she was a holy woman, a mystic. You would never believe that come dawn, she would strap on a sword and ride to war. As the crowd broke up, she sank to her knees in the turf, face turned towards the church bells tolling in the distance. She would be there for hours, and in the morning rise as if she had slept heartily. I should ask her voices where to trap the coming army. Ermelon thought sourly and turned away. Young Marcel Renard fell into step beside him. I've been thinking about our problem, he declared. I wasn't aware that we had one. Marcel was the younger son of one of the army sponsors, a merchant-born knight with finer armor and manners than the few nobles who had been swept up in the conversion. He was a great friend of the maid's scheming brother, Jean, and perhaps the closest thing to a courtier that Ermelon had encountered in the ranks of his new church. Marcel's thoughts moved as if they were oil, always seeking the easiest path to what he wanted. It was a turn of mind Ermelon sometimes admired. Of course we have a problem, you old skunk. We cannot fight Charles. I see no way to avoid it. You look for no way. Come, Ermelant, it'll just toss him into the Pope's lap. Your pardon, but he is already there. So far, all he's done is march. Charles hasn't molested any of the Jeannest listener, Ermelant corrected urgently. They were still close enough that Joan might overhear. Listener, Towns, yes. They've passed through several now without burning them. A king can't afford to massacre his subjects at will. I think Charles is undecided, my friend. He may not mind having the Pope's hand on France's shoulder, but he doesn't want it around her neck, either. Pretty words, Ermelande grunted. Do they mean anything? Marcel pointed at the moonlit figure of their praying leader. Why did the English want the church to condemn her? to prove the king illegitimate, that's why. Why did Charles have her retried? He thought her all but dead. He didn't try to keep resentment out of his voice. To prove his rightful claim to the throne. Marcel's face was aglow with excitement, the certainty of youth that everything could be fixed, that great fires could be put out, like candles, with breath alone. If Charles opposes her now, he makes himself a bastard again. What would you have us do? Convert him? Give him a way to come to us honorably. Dispense with teaching Latin to farmers and translate the Bible into French. Let that be the text we preach from. The crown prince will strengthen ties with Rome when Charles dies. But if the old king has established an independent church... Ermelon stared at the merchant's son. You think it is impractical, Marcel said finally a hint of uncertainty in his voice. I think it is obvious and elegant. It could solve, as you say, our problems. He said it with funereal solemnity. Marcel scratched his head. You do not think she will agree? Her voices tell her to say the mass in Latin, to teach us to memorize the Bible as it is written. She didn't think that part through. This is much easier, and God won't mind. There is no chance, my son, Ermelon said. Not in heaven, not on this earth, and not in hell. Follow God, not me. A young girl kneels before Joan, who tries to raise her to her feet. Behind the maid's shoulder, a winged infant with a halo hovers, its whole being outlined in silver light. Larks nest in the grass in the bottom corners. Most scholars analyze this scene in the context of Joan's characteristic rejection of special status within her own cult. 
It should also be noted, however, that the kneeling girl is said to be the sister of a stillborn infant Joan allegedly revived from death in a village called Lenny. The child survived just long enough to be baptized. Unlike the many conflicting accounts of Joan's miracles during the Jeannist Holy War, this earlier event was well documented, and Joan spoke of it herself at the heresy trial in 1431. There were only six soldiers in the maiden's tent this evening. One merry farm girl turned lancer having been crushed by a cannonball in their last battle. The new archer tried hard to fill the hole in their chatter, but she was better suited to the crossbow than conversation. Every time she spoke up, she merely drew attention to the loss. Dulice was sitting with them when she heard Joan return. Soft footsteps and a rustle of fabric that should have been imperceptible, was she not as attuned to it as a mother was to the faintest movements of her babe. She excused herself, stepping carefully over muddy ground toward the tent she shared with Joan. Low fires burned across the camp. The smells of wood smoke and cooking pork teased her nostrils, spiced when the wind shifted, with a hint of latrine. The breeze made the night cold even for springtime. Hunching her shoulders and hugging herself, Dulice quickened her pace. Joan was sitting on her pallet, cross-legged in a plain shirt and breeches, as unaffected by the chill as she was by all other bodily complaints. A single candle burned beside her, playing golden light over the sword resting across her knees. She gave no sign that she knew Dulice was there. Dulice touched the bottle of ink she kept on a chain at her throat. I have been thinking about drawing a picture of you in prison, she said. Marcel says nobody will prefer a plain picture. They will if his father stops selling the one with the angels. Dulice licked her lips. You said you had visions when you were locked up in the castle of Philippe Auguste. Hush. Joan's face hardened. Your story brings people to our faith, Joan. If you had visions, when I talk of such things, Dulice, they get bent into tales I don't recognize. You can't control what people say, Dulice wheedled. All you can do is make the truth known. She was sure she had gone too far, that she would get nothing, but Joan shifted slightly, expelling a long breath. Two visions, yes. In the first, I never recanted. Conchon took me to the stake and they lit the fire. And can you guess? It wouldn't catch. They tried so hard they burned the ropes binding me. I stepped away from the pyre. The crowd there had come to cheer me off to hell, but when the ropes fell away from the stake, the people's hearts were opened. They spirited me away and I went back to war. I drove the English out of France. Dulice reached for her pen, but a look from Joan stopped her. The maid patted the ground at her hip and she sat, conscious of the knotted muscles of her heroine's shoulder pressing against her shawl, of Joan's heat against her cold skin. You said there were two? In the second vision I recanted, Joan said. My jailers did all the things you heard took away the dress I was to wear so I was naked, sent that soldier to rape me, left my men's clothing handy as a temptation to relapse. Dulice's teeth clenched. The ordeals had gone on for months before the false priests had put out their torches and resigned themselves to having them made as a prisoner instead of firewood. In my dream, I bore it for three days. Then I found my courage put on my clothes and told them I was done. They burned me in Rouen, as they'd planned all along. Her voice was matter of fact. I was brave, I think, at the execution. You're always brave. I gave in to fear when I recanted, didn't I? She darted her hand through the candle flame, leaving a fat smear of soot on her fingers. But fire burned away that sin. It hurt terribly. You felt it, Dulice interrupted, like I was there. Oh, don't look like that. 
All suffering passes, is it not so? Despite her words, Joan shuddered faintly. It's still suffering. It was a faster penance than prison. And when I was purified, St. Catherine and St. Margaret carried me away. Up. Delisa's breath hitched. He saw heaven. A glimpse. So wonderful, I sometimes can't believe I have remained down here so long. But how unfair to feel the fire and not to fully taste the reward. It's a pleasure delayed, that's all. Joan pinched wax drippings off the candle and smeared them on her fingers. If I'd burned then, I'd be forgotten now, don't you think? No, you crowned Charles. Pah. People could say anything once I was gone. They made me a witch at my trial when I was standing right there. She scowled. You guard me from those lies now, Dulis. You take what's real and pin it to the page. If I'm tried again, God forbid. It's all caught in pictures, just as it happens. No lies, no foolish rumors. Joan flipped the sword lightly, fingering its blade. It was a poor substitute for her first, or so she'd often claimed. That had come from the monastery at St. Catherine de Fierbois, and she'd broken it over the back of a camp follower. God waited thirteen years to take me into his heart again, Dulis. He's sending me toward Charles, and yet, I know we must not fight. What will you do? Tears welled in the maid's eyes. I won't break with my voices. Not in the tiniest way. They say to go forward. Dulis picked at her toenail, feeling sullen. She might never admit it, but there were times when she disliked God so much she wanted to cut her own heart out to feed the pieces to pigs. I know you hate praise, she swallowed, forcing herself to continue. But it took strength to stay in prison all that time. It takes no strength to lie where you are chained, dear Dulis. You were strong, she said fiercely, staring at the steam of her breath. Then Joan's arms came around her in a crushing hug so suddenly she nearly cried out. Come on, let's sleep, Joan said. They curled up in the blankets like sisters, and the chill finally forced itself out of Dulise's bones. It was waiting for her later, though, when her bedmate's breath finally loosened into sleep, and she could creep out again, driven to capture by candle flame the images of the two dreams. A little brawl at Neuf Chateau. Knights and men at arms brawl with peasant Janists near a Franciscan monastery. The maid is in the foreground, dressed in a partial suit of armor and brandishing a short sword. Behind her is the abbot who summoned the knights. Joan is defending him from her own people. Enraged Janists burn the monastery, framing Joan's form in flames. In the lower left corner, a newly converted brother Ermelon battles the Duc d'Alençon, leader of the church forces. D'Alençon was very close to Joan in the days before her trial, and it was believed he would take the maid into custody with no difficulty. Instead, he found himself at the center of a riot that even the maid had difficulty quelling. While she would later speak of this first battle dismissively, the Ermelon Testament reports she was heartbroken at the Jeanne's destruction of the monastery and the death of her friend. To arms! To arms! Ermelon was half-dressed when Joan's voice rang through the camp. Her words were clear and carrying, and captains took up the call, scrambling to rouse the men. A few early risers had been setting up for worship, and the ribbons that marked off the place of consecration were knocked down and trampled as people ran back and forth, shouting and seeking their weapons. The maid, already armored and mounted, was galloping away, placing herself between the confused encampment and whatever danger lay ahead. Puffing, Ermelond rushed to join her. They had camped near the ruins of a Jeanist village, a town that had been burnt by a band of the Pope's mercenaries early the previous winter. To the east, he could see the graves of thirty families, 
The makeshift crosses that marked their mounds had been kicked down by vandals or weather. Ahead, abandoned fields and vineyards were growing wild. A stand of trees blocked any view they might have had of the road. Raining hard, Joan stared in that direction, though everything seemed calm enough. Ermelond was about to ask why they were all in a panic when she pointed her sword. There, a glint of light on armor. An ambush. Not anymore. Her smile was broad, almost predatory. She was all warrior today. Is it Charles? No. He didn't know if he was disappointed or relieved. Will. Suddenly, a small force of knights came charging out of the thicket, crushing his plan unformed. Driving forward smartly behind a red banner adorned with a golden cross, they came quickly into bow range. The disarrayed listener archers were able to get off only a thin volley of bolts in opposition. Joan spurred her horse and a small company of men-at-arms. Twenty, maybe twenty-five fighters followed her lead. It was all they had mustered so far to protect the chaotic camp behind them. Cursing, Ermelond joined her, while Marcel Renard closed in on Joan's left side. The three of them became the center of the thin defending wall. The two sides met in the middle of the overgrown meadow with a crash of weaponry and armor. Catholic or Jeanist, it ceased to matter to the dead as they fell. Shrieks filled the air as blades clashed against shields. Joan, as always, drew more than her share of enemy attack. With Marcel and Ermelon fighting fiercely on either side of her, the odds were just barely fair. Cutting at would-be assassins, Ermelon found his arm muscles aching with familiar soreness. Sweat rolled inside his armor, breath steamed out of his visor in gusts. A sudden pocket of quiet fell on the three of them as the fighting moved elsewhere on the line. Joan drew herself up instantly, scanning the enemy's rear. There! She shouted so loudly her voice rasped. Heads turned to see where she was pointing, a spot about twenty feet away. The faithful, knowing her keen eye for cannon placements, scrambled away. Moments later, an explosion ruptured the runaway grapevines. Ermelon's horse staggered, perhaps struck by a clod of dirt from the blast. He dropped his shield, fighting for balance. And a knight with a short sword came straight at him, weapon high, screaming a prayer. Marcel shouted a useless warning. Ermelon bellowed too, as if his voice alone could block the fatal blow. But a single swipe of the maid's sword saved him, knocking the attacker onto his back. His helmet fell loose, showing a young face gored with a mortal wound. Now she'll start to weep, Ermelon thought, heart skipping at the close call as he gathered himself at last. As the battle wore on, soldiers from the camp fell into companies, swelling and strengthening the line. They showed a discipline they had lacked in their early months together, and though the churchmen tried twice to push past them, Joan had the numbers now, and she turned back the charges easily. The herald was one of the last to find his place, pushing to the fore nearly an hour into the battle. He bore up the listener pennant, a white banner ornamented with an unlit torch and a lark. Cheers broke out among the army as they saw it, and the enemy faltered. Marcel, gather up a company and get behind them, Joan ordered. Take their supplies. By now, the listener army was fully deployed. Their would-be destroyers routed, but the assurance of victory did no more than it ever did to quicken the end. The battle played itself out to a bloody conclusion. When it was finally over, the Jeanist had captured two Coulouvrines, along with some cannonballs and a few hundred pounds of gunpowder. Only fifty or so of the enemy had escaped. Too many, Ermelant told Joan as they left the field. They must have been going to meet up with his majesty. Now he'll know to expect us. I'm sure he has spies in Burgundy just like you. He must already have known. Better that it be probable than a certainty. Cheer up, friend, she squeezed his arm. If they'd caught us at mass, we'd be at judgment now. One whole army praying forever. Her eyes sparkled, teasing him. Ermelon was nodding when he spotted Dulis. She sat exposed on a hill, too near the fighting. Imagining herself unseen, she drew furiously. 
his face reddened, and he snapped at Joan. I suppose this victory means God wants you to fight the king. Joan's face tightened, and the color raised by the battle drained away. We drove the English out of France, and now we'll drive out the church. This is our mission. Which was no answer, but he reined his temper with difficulty. And do we march through the afternoon or rest? We consecrate the graves in the village, she said, striding away. She left Ermelon to strip the prisoners of their arms and regret that she wouldn't order them hanged. Want to find out where Joan's life goes from there? Join us in our next episode for part two. In the meantime, check out Roanoke Falls. It's 1587 and someone is punishing the people of the Roanoke colony with blood. If you have sinned, beware. Or let Beatrix Green transport you to Victorian England, where a group of sleuths become trapped in a haunted house and try to escape the wrath of a vengeful ghost. Both shows are out now and available wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, whatever dimension you're in, safe travels. You're listening to Tales Beyond Time, created and produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Listen away. Tales Beyond Time, episode 23, features A Key to the Illuminated Heretic, written by A.M. Della Monica. It is produced by Mary Asadolahi and Marco Palmieri, associate produced by Alexis Latshaw, and executive produced by Molly Barton, hosted by Marco Palmieri and performed by Sharomi Arcerio and Matt Godfrey, audio produced by Spoken Realms, additional editing by Nicholas Papaleo, cover art by Kendall Thomas. <laughs>